12 inch, 13 inch, 15 inch. All right, young scholars, tonight we're going to cover web multimedia and interactivity. Then we're going to do a simple HTML example. But before we jump in, I wanted to point out <clears throat> the remainder of the semester here. So tonight we're remote Halloween. The next two weeks we're going to be face to face. Then you guys have off Tuesday the 21st. I gave you off for Thanksgiving that week. Then we have two remote classes after that. And then the last class meeting when you present your project, that website that you're building, that will all be done on the 12th. Should be pretty easy, quick class. I think there's only nine young scholars, 10 minute presentation each. Should be fairly simple to get through. And your final proposal should be, yeah, in the 1114 folder. So if anybody's already fixed that up based on my feedback off of the original one, it's in there. Good evening, Jonathan. <clears throat> so again, the next two weeks, we'll be meeting face-to-face. -face. I'll send out a reminder the Monday before 
um, because some of you had difficulty finding that new classroom they moved us to last time. Then two more remote, and then that last class will be, as I said, that 10 minute presentation of your website that you've built. All right, so web multimedia and interactivity. When you think of the word interactive, what do you think of? I think of content that isn't that isn't like static, like something that changes with when the user input when the user makes hence the name interactions with it. Okay, give me an example. For instance, like a menu bar on a website, when I hover over, sometimes when I hover over it, then new sub menus can open under it. Okay. What about like on an app? What would interactivity be there? Um, it would be like different pages. Um, how when you scroll, do inertia scrolling, like the the page reacts to the movement of your finger and like. Kind of like when you flick it, scrolls quickly. Okay. So can that be done on a web site? Um, possibly. Like, I guess it depends on what you want to do on the website. You have a touch screen on your laptop? Um, no, but I have a multi-touch trackpad, which has inertia scrolling. And you've tried it on websites? Does it go quicker the quicker you flick it? Yeah. So what's your answer? So yes. Then. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so as you've seen in previous class sessions, sometimes we put our information in certain areas within <clears throat> a certain section of your web page, let's say. But when you're thinking about file extensions, like a video or a audio file, they're usually featuring containers and codec. So who still uses like Windows Media Player? Anyone? So years ago, when you had Windows Media Player and you tried to play like a like a song off of a CD, it would say, oh, we need to update the codec in order to play this. And it would take like two or three minutes for them to download from the internet, and then you were able to play your song. <clears throat> the container is where all the information is. Let's say you had a song. What kind of information comes with a song? The artist, uh, the production company. The artist's uh, name, the production company, maybe the producer themselves. What else? The length, the genre, the bit rate, the format. Okay. Those might be very specific stuff that might be hidden Licensing. in the background. What was that, Rob? Licensing. Okay. Maybe the year. Where did they come from? Oh. Maybe the album title. What's a file extension, music-wise? What might it be? MP3, M4A, FLAC. FLAC? Yeah, F-L-A-C. That's like for lossless stuff. Okay. So these are the most common you'll probably see. A WAV file is kind of outdated these days. MP3, like Dylan said. What's an M4A? 
Have anybody seen them before? Yes. So explain them. Um, it's MPEG, it's an MPEG-4 format, but it's just the audio part, so there's no video. So it's so little like an MP4 is an MPEG-4 video. It's just the audio half. And um, I have a lot of like music from Apple. So that's usually in that format. Mm -hmm. They only run on specific Apple products. <clears throat> so if you tried to run it, let's say Windows Explorer, Windows Media Player, it's not going to run properly. Have you ever heard of a dot .mid? No? Nobody's heard of a MIDI, a musical instrument digital interface? So back in the old days, it was common for individuals to have their websites set up to where they would play either an MP3 or a MIDI file when you visited a website. The problem is, Dylan, what's your favorite song? Uh, I don't... Uh... I don't know. I've never heard uh, that. Music. There's a lot of music I like, but I couldn't name you like a favorite like song. Okay, just name any song then that you like. Um, <laughs> Space Song by Beach House. Okay. So what would happen if you put Space Song by Beach House on your website? Um, It would, if I just had the file on my web server, it would do nothing. Unless, if you had like, it playing on your website, what would happen? Um, it um it might try to autoplay, and uh, um, the browser is going to automatically suppress that since most browser browsers like block autoplaying music these days. But what might happen to you? Um, I might get into legal trouble because I don't have the song licensed. Yeah, you're violating copyright law. So they find out, they come after you. So that's what MIDI's were made for. They're basically the, the background without the, the noise. So you could have, um, you've all seen like the Jurassic Park song, that do 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 that would in essence be like a MIDI. There's no, <clears throat> there's nothing other than the music track. There's no singing, there's no vocals. So that was one way that individuals would get around copyright issues. Hey, you know, I don't have to have the, you know, the words for the song. If I have the MIDI, I play the MIDI and they know the words because they know the, the music in the background. There's also common video file types. So what's the most common here, Dylan? You mentioned it before. MP4. And what's the other one? M4V. You said it before. Uh, MPG? No. I said... M4V, MP4, MPEG4. The back. Right? That's what M4V yeah. is. Now, what's the major difference between Web M and these others? Um, the other, um, they're stuff like the MPEG is like standardized by like a certain like company. So like, if you want to use it, you have to license it. Like, and WebM is just, and WebM is like optimized for the internet. Mm -hmm. and is, so WebM may not necessarily even be a video. It could be a GIF. It could be an image that's displayed in video format. 
I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Whenever you're on Reddit, say you wanted to save an image or a meme, something like that on Reddit, even if it's a picture, it's probably going to pop up as the WebM file. Now, which is the most common one, Dylan, for the Apple products? M4V. Mm -hmm. And again, like I mentioned with the dot waves being a little outdated, the dot WMV for the Windows Media File are also a bit outdated these days. But again, back in the day, individuals would upload these kinds of files to their web page to play video files. How did they do it now, Dylan? Streaming. Streaming? Streaming what? How do they put videos on their websites now? Um, they usually put them on a different video hoster and just embed them. Okay. What's the most common YouTube. video? YouTube, yep. I will show that later on. How you could just simply embed YouTube code rather than the old school way. So this is the old school way. Who remembers what that href stands for? Reference. Hyperlink yeah. reference. Hyperlink reference, yep. So this long line of code there, what is it doing? Creating a hyperlink reference to um the podcast mp3 yep so this text here that says web design podcast if this were on a real live server and we click that it would download that wdf podcast.mp3 doesn't really help anybody right i mean you'd prefer to just play it right on the website right as opposed to having to download it, right? That's why you'll often see something like this instead, where they'll embed either the audio or video in order for you to play it right off of the <clears throat> web page. But again, this is the old school way of doing it. So you would have to create your code, audio controls, controls, which gives you this play, your sound, et cetera. Then you would have to input the source, where's the sound coming from, whether it's an MP3, an OGG, and then you could create an additional link if you so choose, to allow them to download the file. You know, hey, it may be you set it up where they only have, you know, 37 seconds of audio, like in this example. But the actual, let's say it's a song, is three minutes long. You let them play a sample. You create a link underneath that allows them to download full entire saw. So what is this as an example of Dylan? Audio image video looks like video, right? We have a random dog just sitting there on the grass with a play button. We play that. Maybe the dog runs around the yard. <clears throat> Maybe he starts barking since it says Sparky Speaks. So similarly, instead of audio controls, you would set that up as video controls. And who remembers from a couple of weeks ago why we would change the width and height? <clears throat> Mm 
um you want to make it not too big so like it doesn't just dominate the web page yeah and so it loads and there's no issues so the way this one is set up is we have a image of sparky as our control so we click that image of sparky then the video plays. Again, old school way of doing it. <clears throat> now everybody would just embed their specific file, <clears throat> upload it on YouTube, SlideShare, whatever specifically they would want to do. All right, Dylan, you talked about this a little earlier. Copyright issues. What are they? Explain. Um, so basically, if you use elements in your web page, including images and music and movies, among other things, you need to make sure that the content you use, you have the license to, or you use something that maybe is royalty free, or something that doesn't require a license to use of any sort. Basically, you need to make sure that you legally can use a resource before you use it. So let's say Rob takes a picture of you in class next Tuesday. Can he put that on his website? Um, With his consent, correct? Yes. <clears throat> so the yeah. same type of idea applies. So let's say that, you know, Rob takes a picture. Oh, there's something nice on the wall. Or he, he sees a pretty girl walk by and he takes a picture and you happen to be in it. That's one thing. But if he happens to take like a straight up picture of you or you're the only focus of the image, same thing would apply. He would have to get permission from you in order to use that specific image. So this is what happened huge in this area i don't know were any of you born in the 90s <clears throat> back in the 90s this was a big issue everybody was sharing videos and music on these different sites you may have heard of like napster online and people were just using them willy-nilly trading them even though they did not have the authority to do so. So then things like iTunes came about where people would have to pay, you know, like 99 cents for a song, you know, $10 for an album, whatever it is, so that they basically could track, oh, okay, you know, Dylan, uh, what was that song called? South Beach? A song? This song you said before that you liked yeah what was it called space song it's a okay. song by beach house okay so he pays 99 cents for the song by beach house he goes and emails it to rob what happens um i'm basically i'm not i'm doing something illegal because it's supposed to be purchased for my personal use only. Yep. You would be considered a pirate. You would be pirating music and they know that, hey, you purchased this song. They would have like a... Do you ever use any of those like Pearson softwares for any of your classes? You like did a quiz or had to upload something? Yeah. Like Pearson My IT Lab, if you've had like an intro to IT class. So they would have basically some kind of code associated with you, your account, your downloads, and they would easily be able to track you. Oh, he's pirating music again. You know, the first time they'd probably like, and eh, maybe he made a mistake. The second time, they'll probably come after you. So the big issue is, like I said, because everybody was just willy-nilly 
trading around these videos and you know audio files people were just putting them up on their websites you'd go to a website and you know you'd hear some michael jackson song playing and it's like oh well obviously you don't have the you know authority to be playing michael jackson songs on some random website about your cat what's up with that and they started cracking down on it that's why as dylan said before most of these web browsers will now suppress autoplay of audio when you go to a website wants you to be in control allow you to play what you want to play <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, you always want to focus on every user. Even though you might have your select audience, you want to be able to provide content that helps for everybody. So you might have captions over images or video. Hey, you know, this, this is a picture of my cat, George. This is a picture of my dog, Tony, et cetera. But what's a transcript good for? A transcript is visual, so it allows someone to read maybe a piece of audio that they not that they may not necessarily want to listen to, like a lecture or a podcast. Okay. Also good for accessibility. Yeah, both of you are correct. They may just want to like browse through like, oh, where's the party talked about uh, this specific topic I need to, to get a refresher on? Or, as Rob said, for accessibility, you may have, you know, old, older person who's hard of hearing. You may have um, other instance where they may want a specific transcript for that audio recording, the video recording, with the information available to them. Say they had a hearing aid and, you know, they were in a public place, couldn't put on headphones, they would probably just read the transcript and said, based on their possibilities or availabilities. And you'll see that these days with YouTube, where you could click a button and it'll try to give you a transcript or everything that is specifically recorded. <clears throat> so while it's a little uncommon, some people will use a drop down menu using CSS to drop down some kind of video or audio element. Do you think that would look good? Probably not, right? You want your audio or video display to be right smack dab in the middle, easy for you to look at. So here's an example. Let's say I went and clicked on the breakfast menu there. <clears throat> and it played a, a video of somebody serving out pancakes. Is it going to look good in that little area? Or would it look probably better, you know, if you click the breakfast tab and it showed up in the middle? Which would look better, confined in this small space or in your bigger section, your body of your web page? Nobody knows. I'd say it would look big, better in the bigger area. You'd be able to see it. If it was in this small section, how are you going to see what's on the pancakes? Are they blueberry, chocolate? Do they look like they're made right? Do they look like they taste good? 
<clears throat> so you can use a transform property as well with your CSS instead of doing that. So you notice how this image is on a little slant. That's what we're doing with the transform, rotating three degrees. What if I rotated this 180 degrees? How would it look? So it's up like this. What would 180 upside be? Upside down. If it was 90 degrees, it'd be right. If it was 270, it'd be turned to the left. If it was 180, it'd be flipped upside down. So that would generally be an area where you'd want to put an image or video file. It's easy to see. You could use the transform or the height and width. Let's say you wanted to put two videos there. You'd play around with your height and width controls until both videos sat in that space there. Or what did I recommend a couple weeks ago? What is there too much of here in the middle? Words. Yep, too much text. So maybe we separate pastries and coffee with a video of somebody serving, you know, a cup of coffee and pastries or an image of the coffee and pastries. And then, you know, for panoramic view, we show what the view is. Oh, we're, we're close to the ocean. Oh, we're right near the city. Make it look like people actually want to go there. <clears throat> so what do you think transition properties are? Have you used like the effects in a PowerPoint before? What is a transition effect in PowerPoint? It goes between, it helps um, bridge the gap between two different elements in a fancy visual way. Okay. So what is this code doing here? Background color 2S linear. It's changing the color of the background actively. Of what? Of the, of the hover, like when you hover the mouse over the, when the, um, the menu options. Okay, so when you hover over this menu bar, it's making your background color a little thicker as you go down your linear line. So you scroll from menu to home, that separating line in between might look a little dark. But does that really help anybody? What might you use instead? Let's say you have this image here or a video there. What might you put around it that we've talked about with CSS instead of adding a transition to the menu? Border and embed. Uh. Yeah, you could use a border. Let's say you wanted a, what is that? An image of a lighthouse. Let's say you wanted that to pop. What kind of color might you put around that? Your site is like grayish blue and, you know, there isn't much color to it. What color might you put around that lighthouse image? Maybe a red, a green, a purple, an orange. This way you get people's eyes on it. Oh, oh, there's an image there. Oh, I see the border. Okay. Now that's just one image though. What would happen if you wanted to have multiple images? Dylan, what's an app you use that has a gallery in it? Um, the Photos app. What else? Instagram. 
Instagram. So in my uh, Android app development class yesterday, we talked about grid view versus image view. Do you know the difference? Um, in Instagram, the grid view is that it's three images in a yeah, row. Yeah, it's like just the Im yeah three just three images in a row, and it's just an endless flow of just the images. And you tap the image to see like likes and captions you, and stuff. So those three images in a row that would be the grid view. When you tap the image and make it bigger, that would be considered image view. So the problem with image galleries, though, is unless you have your code set up effectively, like, say, in Instagram, you know, they take forever to load. They look great, but what did you call it a couple weeks ago, Dylan, looking through all the pictures when they're one at a time? What was it called? Doom something? Doom scrolling. Doom scrolling. So if you had a bunch of pictures all on one page, it would be doom loading. It would take forever. So often, especially now, people, what's the like photo bucket? They'll upload all their images to a, a website similar to like YouTube and embed them into a page and just let people click through a nice slideshow display of all these different images. So in this instance, can you even tell how many images you have in this gallery? How many images do we have? Um. One. One? Two. Two? No, no. Are we guessing? Technically, we have two, but it's exactly as I had recommended a couple weeks ago. You have your thumbnail set up, a very small image that's linked out to the bigger version of the image. So in essence, a thumbnail and then an image to make it bigger. Just like when you're on your Instagram app. That image, you know, it's three in a row. It kind of looks more like this. You click it, it takes up your entire phone, right? So in order to do stuff like that, you could set a specific position. How far is it from the left, et cetera. And that, if you were to have a look at the Instagram code, on Instagram.com is basically what it's doing. Setting up those three pictures in a grid view. So they're all lined up every row as you go through your page. <clears throat> so here's an example of, in essence, this code on slide 19, where you would click each of these thumbnails and the larger version of the image would pop up. So which image is clicked right now? It should be pretty obvious from the screen. Waterfall near Big Sur. Yeah, so which the of the six one. images is picked? The fourth one. This fourth one? See how the cursor's over it, clicked on it? We get that pop-up display of the bigger version of it. <clears throat> so again, a lot of this stuff in these slides that, you know, was from the textbook that Dr. Mondale and others have used for this class before, a lot of this references old school stuff that, you know, people did before they knew how to do things right with web development. So here's another one, animations. Why do you think animations might be an issue? Animations might confuse the user. They may not scale correctly to all devices. Mm -hmm. What else? It may just add clutter. Okay, what else? 
makes it harder to navigate. My block elements. Okay. What kind of cartoons did you watch when you were younger, Dylan? Um, SpongeBob, Tom and Jerry. Do you still watch them? Not really. You outgrew them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the problem with potential CSS animations. That if you don't do them exactly right, they may make your website look childish. Like we showed you the example. What was it called? Cool math games, I think, that my students always tell me to go to. And it kind of looks like it's, you know, built for kind of, you know, kids to use, right? We have all these different games available. Whereas if you go to ESPN, the animations are different, right? They're geared more towards user experience, ads, videos, transition between different topics, right? <clears throat> so sometimes you want to have specific details on your website with information why is that helpful? Think back to our discussion about music. The more information you can provide the user, the better they understand. With that music example, we said, you know, they might have the producer's name, the singer's name, the year it was produced. Um, the production company. If you just have like, oh, this is the waterfall in wherever. Is anybody really going to understand that? If you add more details to it. Oh, th this waterfall is from Bozeman, Montana on June 14th, 1922. That gives the user who's visiting that page more context, more understanding. <clears throat> Who else does it help? Again, think back to accessibility. It helps people that um, need like alternate like forms of receiving the information like they can't see. Um, yeah, they, they might have a, a text reader. Oh, okay, Th this image is about uh, whatever. You know, the Bozeman, Montana Mount or, uh, you know, Dylan's favorite puppy or something like that. <clears throat> so here would be a representation of that. So you have principles of visual design, repetition, contrast, proximity, alignment. Which one do we know has details associated with it? We know the second one has, we know that there's details because if you click the triangle, then it reveals details. Yeah, we just know that for repetition. When we click the triangle, the carrot to open for repetition, it gives us the detailed message. Repeat visual components throughout the design. We're not 100% sure about the other three. We assume, because the first one has it, but we're not 100% sure. We haven't clicked out to find them there. So we just know that that first instance, repetition, has additional details. <clears throat> Who's ever heard of JavaScript before? So I'm pretty sure the... 28th of November and the 5th of December, that's all we're going to talk about is JavaScript. But who's heard of it before? 
I've heard yeah. of it. You've heard of it? Do you know what it is? It's another form of a programming language. It's some people disagree with this, but it's basically an extension of the Java programming language for the web. Now, it's not a hundred percent match to your Java programming language, but it allows you to extend a lot of those components and concepts. So you could create objects, methods, etc., using JavaScript right within your web page. And you'll see this, I'll talk extensively about on clicks. You know what an on click is? An on click is you click something and something happens. On click, you know, once you click something, something happens. You click within the PowerPoint, you're able to edit the text. You click on the Pearson logo, nothing. That's in the footer, that's set up. You go in, you see, oh, that, that last name might be spelled wrong. Technically it's spelled correctly, but because it's an odd name, Microsoft thinks that it's wrong. <clears throat> so what are some common uses of JavaScript? The most common is usually with a status message. You go to a website, hey, welcome to our website. You click on something, oh, today is uh, the 4th of July. What's an image rollover? When you hover your mouse over like an image, then some then like interactive elements may happen, may like appear. Yeah. You just roll over an image and it'll spit out maybe a caption like, oh, this is uh this is Rob's cat. You know, she's seven. Why would you want to use JavaScript to edit and validate form information? Didn't we work uh, on this last week? Yeah, because um, instead of creating like a pure HTML form, it's generally better to create it in like JavaScript or PHP. Did any of you learn so far in uh, your programming classes um, exception handling? No. So exception handling is basically you assume somebody's going to mess up. So you put in a handler for an exception, an issue beforehand to catch it and solve it. So the most common one is usually data mismatch. So you ask a user for a string, they put in an integer. It'll just push it in as a string without an exception handler saying, no, no, we want a string, make it a string. That's what JavaScript will do to validate a form. No, 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 we want a real email. We're not gonna let this form go through unless you give us a real email. So it validates. Similarly, you could display the current date using JavaScript. And what would that do? Simple. Every time somebody goes to a web page and refreshes it, it's just going to show whatever today's date is. I go to a web page today. It shows us Halloween. I go tomorrow. It shows us November 1st, etc. What would calculations be? You probably see this all the time when you go on different websites, do like shopping. What are the calculations? <clears throat> That's like, um, if you're adding things to the cart, then it has to add the price of all your items in the cart. It has to calculate shipping costs and taxes mm -hmm. and fees. 
Yep. And it constantly has to update based on your decisions. What you add to the cart. You only have one thing on the cart. You have three things on the cart. You have four things on the cart. Oh, you have a gift card. Do you want to use the gift card? Oh, do you want free shipping? We're offering free shipping on two of these seven products you're buying. All of that is set up behind the scenes with JavaScript. But just like PHP, it's client side. Or excuse me, it's the opposite of PHP. It's client side. So what does that mean? PHP had to be where? It has to be stored. You have to have PHP installed on your web server. PHP has to be server side for it to actually run. JavaScript is client side. So just like all these examples we're playing around with in the HTML editor, same thing with JavaScript. It could just be locally hosted on your specific page. <clears throat> so document object model, did you learn this in programming or no? No. So basically it defines every object and element on a web page in a hierarchical structure. And it has access to the elements and styles associated with those. So when you think of it in terms of Java, you start with what? What's the first thing you always start with in a Java program? Public what? Public static? No. What? What's before the method? Public class? Yeah. Wait. You have your class first. You name your class. Then within your class, you create your methods. Then you might, let's say you're creating a circle, you create an object within your method, and it goes down each piece at a time. Your class, your method, your object, your variables, et cetera. <clears throat> so in the case of a web page, it'd be your window, your browser, your document, history, location, what would the location be? Any idea? Where you're uploading, or excuse me, where you're downloading or refreshing your page on your web browser? Are you just doing it right within Windows Explorer? etc. And then each piece has an a add-on below it. So we'll touch on more of this if you take the 2106 in the spring. But there's also something called AJAX, which is asynchronous JavaScript and XML combined together basically adds the programming power of JavaScript with the data transferring power, if you will, of XML. The problem is it drags all of these more advanced topics together. XHTML. You make a mistake in XHTML, your whole page isn't going to load properly. Whereas if you set up your page as HTML, you make a mistake, the browser will try to interpret what you're looking to do. <clears throat> and again, like I said, we'll touch more on that in the spring in 2106, if you decide to take that with me. So we'll touch on jQuery, I believe the 28th, of November, our whole class is geared towards that. But it's simply an extension or library <clears throat> built to make things easier 
with your server needs, what you're doing. <clears throat> so what do you do, Dylan, when you're creating a program in Java? What's that first line of code you always have that helps you utilize other classes or packages? It begins with an I. What do you have to do to use the scanner class, Dylan, to get user input? What would you have to type? Like, insert, no. Like public class scanner? Before that, what do you have to do in order to use the scanner class or package? Input? Import java.util.scanner, right? So import, basically that's what a jQuery is for us. It's a package or a class we can utilize within JavaScript that allows us to resolve or solve harder problems. <clears throat> So among those solutions that can help us with are making those easier image slideshows so we're not taking a bunch of space or documents or areas. Animation, instead of skewing or transitioning, we can move images, hide them, fade them. Event handling, what does certain clicks do? What ha what happens when I click the close button? Does it close? Does it make it smaller? Document manipulation. Why would you want to manipulate a document? Who uses Amazon? I do. <laughs> what do you want them to be doing with your debit card information when you put it in and buy something. Secure it. Yeah. So they'll manipulate or encrypt that information so that Dylan, you know, sitting there tomorrow at that same computer can't automatically have access to your information. He doesn't know your debit card number, doesn't know your PIN number, etc. The three on the back of your card Security code. So here's an example of what a jQuery slideshow would look. You have your back and forward buttons. You would click through, let's say there's 20 images. You would click through one at a time. Oh, nice, nice, nice. And it's just that one block, that one area where an image is loading. As opposed to if we had 20 images All across the board here, you know, let's say we have five in a row. Doesn't look as nice. And it's going to take forever to load. Even if all 20 images were set up as thumbnails. Well, right, that looks a little cluttered, hard to see, etc. <clears throat> so similarly, HTML5 has APIs. Where you can download resources to use on your own as you need. Have any of you used like GitHub before? None of you yeah. have heard of GitHub? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dylan, what's GitHub? Um, it's like it's a software distribution website. Um, 
that developers usually um, put the entire source code on. It's very good popular for like open source stuff. Mm -hmm. And the same thing revolves around HTML. So for example, years ago on a website I did for a client, he was, he transported motorcycles for a living. And there was a website called Uship. So we used the Google API to have the, all the positive, you know, his five-star ratings show up in the right-hand corner of his website and just scroll through. Unfortunately, about two years later, Google decided to get rid of that API and there was no other option to do that. So we just simply were like, oh, okay, we'll just link it out to your U-Ship site. So you often have to check to make sure that they're still currently being used. They're under development. They're, they, they still exist. And that's the importance of constantly checking. And what did we talk about last week, Dylan? Begin with M. The blank of your website. Maintenance. You always want to be on that website. Oh, okay. This needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. We got to change it. <clears throat> So who's ever heard of geolocation on a website before? Yeah. Yeah, you know what that is? What is it? Um, it allows a website with your permission to receive your geographical location. Okay, what does that mean? That means that um, they can provide relevant information based on your location. Like for example, if I'm on a shopping website and they have my location, they can tell me which um, nearby stores have an item available for pickup. Mm -hmm. What's the most common thing they do on a website for this? Like they have like a, they have like a, a something like a low Google maps embedded on the website. Yeah, like a restaurant will have like Google Maps embedded. Like, oh, enter your current address to get basically information to get to us. You know, here are the directions. You drive two blocks, turn a right, then at the light, make a left, and then we're in the parking lot on the left. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll see it very clearly like that. Other times, as Dylan said, it's more behind the scenes. You go on, let's say, bestbuy.com. You want to buy something. Oh, is your location, you know, whatever town you happen to be in? And you say, yeah, yeah, okay. And then it may say, oh, there, there's eight in stock. Now, what's the problem with that? What are you relying on? You're relying on the lo location services and the accuracy of it. The accuracy of that number. Is there actually eight in the store? Is their system, you know, correct? Is it set up to, you know, have the right number? Because if I'm going to drive over to that store, you know, I want there to at least be one of those products I want to buy. Dylan, do you have any like textbooks for your class? Yeah. So what do you put them in to carry them? I put them in a backpack. You put them in a backpack. Do you put every textbook for every class in every day? No. No? Just for that day, right? Yeah. So the point of that is it can tie into storage. We talked about this with certain folders. Let's say you got, you know, eight JavaScript files. You might want to put them all in a folder called script. You have 27 CSS files. You might want to put them all 
in a folder called style. You have 174 images. You might want to put them all in a folder called image. <clears throat> Your server is only going to have X amount of storage capabilities based on what you're paying for. So what is like local storage, Dylan? That like just holds the data that you need like immediately and doesn't just like throw every, download everything on the site. You know the difference between RAM and ROM? Yeah. Which one would local storage be? Probably the RAM. Why? Because um, RAM access memory is volatile and it um, changes. Whereas ROM or like read-only memory is just not changeable once it's initially flashed and it's, and traditionally it was larger. Okay. So based on what it says about the local storage, which one would it be? It would be the RAM. It stores data without an expiration oh, date. Oh, ROM. The local storage would be ROM. However, the session storage would be RAM. That's the volatile one. Okay, that, that, that disappears after we close the browser. It, it's gone. We don't know where it is. But if you use JavaScript, you could still have access to that. What do you do if a laptop dies? You just chuck it in the street? You erase everything on it. You erase everything on it? You might try to get whatever's on the hard drive, right? So you might have tools associated with that. You might bring it to the guy. <clears throat> That's what JavaScript can do here. Oh, your, your session storage is over. But I could still get that data, retrieve it, use it based on what we need to do with it. <clears throat> so similar to APIs, you can have web applications. And they could be writ written in many different languages, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP. But just like your PHP, they have to be up on a server for them to run. So like a, a Java servlet, as an example. You go on to, like, I guess that Cool Math Games is a good example. You can only play that game right on that specific website. <clears throat> but... There is some limited functionality when you're not active to the web. Why is that? Dylan probably is eating these right now. There was this blue guy on Sesame Street. Cookies. Cookies, yeah. So you might have cookies stored in your web browser to make that website function to some degree, even if you don't have internet access. Now, if you cleared your cache and tried to go back to it, <clears throat> that would be another story. <clears throat> so these work together with other specific APIs, whether it be a manifest API, a service worker API, but ideally, Web applications enhance user experience and are often used for accessibility. So like the screen reader, for example, or that auto-click button on YouTube that'll allow somebody to see a transcript of a video if they wanted. You can do that. You can have an application do that. You could write the code for JavaScript to do it, et cetera. <laughs> You've heard of a canvas with painting before? 
you can also use a canvas element within HTML. It draws lines, shapes, text, images. But again, as I mentioned before with the animations, if you don't do it the right way, it can look kind of childish. So you, that's why, again, you always want to sketch out your... How's my website going to look? Eh, this looks a little childish. I'm, I'm going to make these minor changes. <clears throat> so when it comes to multimedia, what can we do? We want to provide the best experience possible for the visitors of our page, right? So we want to verify that they could use their keyboard, scroll over everything and click on it. We want to provide them as much information as possible. Hey, this is what you're watching. This is what you're listening to. This way the user doesn't become confused, doesn't leave your page immediately, etc. And just like with your HTML, there's often suggestions online for how to meet all of these accessibility needs. You want to have a, an on-click where it automatically produces a transcript for a video? Okay, let's, let's Google how to do that. Let, let's add in that accessibility, et cetera. So now we're going to play around in our HTML editor here. And we're going to create some audio and video examples. First, I'm going to start with a very, very basic one, like they did in the old school. So I'm going to change the title to audio and video example. <clears throat> then I'm going to have a header one that simply says the same thing. <clears throat> then I'm going to create a header two that simply says play an MP3 audio file. Then what do I have to do? Audio controls. Add in a source. And what's the type going to be? Is it video, audio? What's the type? It's audio. So the type will be audio slash MP3. Close out the source. Then just in case there's an issue, Your browser doesn't support the audio element. And then how would I close that? I would have to close the close the audio controls. So it would be close tag for audio. These ads are crazy today. This. So then I would do the same thing with a video example. Create a header to embed a video. Close the header to. 
but this time instead of audio controls, I'm going to set my video width. and then my height within the controls. So now what do I have to do? What did I do above after audio controls? I have to add in my source. Source SRC equals example.mp4, what would the type be? Is it audio or video? Video slash mp4, because that's the file type we're using. then we couldn't put in our same message again, just in case. There's a potential issue. Your browser doesn't support the video element this time. And then instead of closing audio, we close video. But what's gonna happen when we run this? Anything? Go ahead and try it. <clears throat> what happened here when we ran this? Um, there is, it has the um, audio player up and, but there's no audio for it to, you know, pick from mm -hmm. and what about the video there is no video player because there is, there is no um video to pick from and the why is there no video because there's no video named example.mp4 no. Why is there no video? Because the player is not embedded correctly. Yep. See how I have the question mark after controls? That should be the less than sign. So now when we run, we have our embedded video with this error. Why does it show this error, Dylan? Because you don't have a video named example.mp4. Yep, this doesn't exist. We don't have an example.mp4. So before I delete this, I'm going to post it in the class Blackboard. What's today? 31st. There we go. And what should I call this? Dylan, what should I call this? You could old just school. Like, yeah. Old school audio video display. <clears throat> okay, so what's the more common way now to display a video, Dylan? A YouTube embed. Okay. Let's go on YouTube. What does Dylan want embedded in this page? What about yesterday's Apple event? Yesterday's Apple event. Yeah. 
Yep, this? the first one. Yeah. So we click the share button, embed. We highlight our iframe. But where do we put that iframe? You just put it under, replace that with that. You just put it there like that and run. Okay, it works, but I tend to prefer, what I tend to do though, is put all of them inside a paragraph element, just so when you decide to separate them, it's a little easier to do so. So what do we wanna change the header to? Embed a video, don't we want to change that? Embed a match? YouTube video. What should we call it? Embed a YouTube video. Okay. Embed a YouTube video. How would we embed an audio file? We could just copy this link from somewhere. And hopefully it's not an awful sound. It actually works. But why won't it play? We have the source set up. How come it's not playing? Dylan? Because the file link might not be permanent. Okay. Why else? Why else? The second one works. Some of them, when they're set up like this, where they're just for a download link, may only respond as a download. So that first attempt we made was a download link. It may only be set up to where that link only allows you to download it. <clears throat> Whereas in this second instance, it says download, but we copied that URL into our code <clears throat> and now it plays. So some of them, like the first example, may just be set up. All you could do is download it. And then you'd have to upload it onto your server and your source would have to match wherever you downloaded it. Whereas the second one I chose, when I copied that URL from the download and pasted it, you see, now it plays. So do we want to change that header name? Play an MP3 audio file to something else?
it's still an mp3 play a sample mp3 okay play a sample mp3 instead and then maybe let's change our header to say new school audio and video example And you would be able to check those audio controls work. The play button, the volume, the pause, just in the same way that you'd be able to play the YouTube video. Makes sense, right? So I'll go ahead and add that up. I'll call that one New School. What did I call it? New School. What are you in video player? And you notice the difference? Just a little bit of changes to the MP3. You could still play it right within there using the old school method. It doesn't look great, but it still works. Whereas the video player method, unless you have your video actually uploaded on your server to use that specific source, it's just much easier to have it up on your YouTube page, whatever it may be. So like, for example, you go on the Blackboard page and you were to just go to, let's say last week's lecture link. You would click on that. You'd share, embed, copy the iframe. And I could drop that in there <clears throat> and the same kind of setup. Now I changed from the Apple event to last week's lecture. All right, so that is all I had planned to cover tonight. So as a reminder again, next two weeks on Tuesday nights, we have face-to-face -face meetings. I'll send out a reminder next Monday night about the, uh, what was it, University Hall 20-something they moved us to back in uh, the end of September. Yeah. So I'll send out a reminder about that. And again, there's no homework this evening. So you want to focus on, and it's in the 1114 folder, fixing up that project proposal, rough draft based on the feedback I gave you so that you can submit your final draft. If you've done so already, I haven't checked, so keep that in mind. But are there any questions? No? All right, if there are no questions, enjoy the rest of your Halloween, go get some more candy, and I will see you next week. Have a good one, Professor. Have a good one, Professor. Take care.